Hi, everybody. Uh, good morning. Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, we really appreciate it. It's great to see so many people out together um, for us all being communication scholars and, and kind of coming together to share knowledge and meet each other and, and all that great things. We, we have uh, such a good program today, uh, a lot of good sessions that'll be interesting. So just so everybody knows, all of the sessions will be taking place on the second floor. The, the classrooms that they'll be in are on the second floor, so you just take the elevator there. There'll be a student there directing you for where to go. Um, but that's where all of the sessions will be. Up here is where we'll, we're doing this, and then we're going to have the lunch and our keynote in this room. So we'll all come back. Um, we have a lot of people helping um, from students to faculty to NJCA board members. So if you have any trouble, any trouble or questions or anything, you could see me or you could see one of them and, and everybody's happy to help. But again, thank you all for coming. Um, Giving our introduction today is our Provost and Vice President of Academic Affairs here at Kane University. I was so happy when he agreed to this because there's like three or four other conferences going on on campus today, including, I just heard today, the president of the university's wife is doing one. So uh, for the Provost to take the time out today to be here, it's truly appreciated. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Bird. So thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Kane University. Uh, what I'd like to do this morning is three things. Number one, I'd like to tell you a little bit about where you are here at Kane University and where Kane is on its journey. Number two, I'd like to reflect a little bit on your conference theme today about communicating in a post-pandemic world, although post seems sometimes a rather tentative description, but we'll get back to that in a moment. And number three, I want to talk about the role of the communication discipline specifically, uh, not only in the challenges of communicating, but the challenges of trying to re-knit social fabric that has frayed very badly over the course of not just these pandemic years, uh, but I would argue at least the totality of the 21st century as we have experienced it to date. So let me start first with Kane University. Uh, you are here on the top floor of one of our newest academic buildings, the North Avenue Academic Building. Uh, we have have a lot of clinical lab space in here, but as you look out across through these glorious windows, uh, you see two new uh, Kane buildings as well. Our STEM Center uh, immediately down Morris Avenue and a little bit further there with the round roof on the top, our Green Lane Academic Building. All of these built within the last few years in this century. And they express the direction that, gain, that Kane has taken in these past few cycles. Uh, trying to expand our footprint, trying to expand our facilities making a faculty that is second to none in northern New Jersey and embracing our designation as voted by the legislature in summer of 2021 and signed by the governor in November of that same year, making Kane New Jersey's first urban research institution. Now, what does that mean? What it means as a practical matter is that Kane takes very seriously the challenges faced by urban communities here in New Jersey, but those are analogous to, to urban challenges across the United States. States and the need to involve people in those communities in studying what's happening on the ground and in finding effective solutions to the challenges that when solved make us all stronger. That principle of inclusion, that principle of involvement, that, it's, that insistence on engagement every step of the way means that we tilt our educational programs toward the communities and toward active engagement with the world. It it means that we have to embrace the larger spheres of scholarly endeavor that animate those activities and provide us with the rich theoretical arm armatures that allow us to hold the objects of study in our hands and understand them better. But that happens through sharing. So Kane, you will see over the course of the coming months and years, will continue to build its programs in STEM, will continue to grow its faculty, will continue to build literally as well as figuratively toward a more inclusive and a more effective environment. 
We have hired over just these last two cycles 108 new tenure track faculty members. Uh, that's very close to 50% of our entire tenure track faculty stream before we started this process in 2021. Um, and that is the fastest percentage hiring going on at any university in the United States right now. There are larger universities that are hiring more people, but as far as a percentage of your tenure stream faculty, Kane is growing faster than anyone else. Our grant receipt is up, I'm ready for this, 1,400% over last year, and we're not done with the year, I'll observe. Uh, just this week, we were uh, in receipt of a Noyce Foundation grant from the National Science Foundation, uh, which will actually propel 20 new STEM scholars serving underserved and underrepresented communities in science education for each of the next four years. Full ride scholarships, very exciting. And that part of just, uh, just a part of $9 million of new NSF funding since September 1st of this year. So we're on the move, and we're very excited about that. Uh, the Carnegie uh, 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 Association, together with the American Council on Education, now responsible for establishing the R1 and R2 uh, status of universities, will be voting on uh, in 2024, and we fully expect to be designated at that point as an R2 university. So if you haven't been to Kane before, this is the new Kane. If you have been to Kane before, this is the new Kane. Uh, and that's going to be moving forward at speed for a number of years to come. So we're delighted to have you here today. I'm sorry it's not better weather, uh, but beautiful campus to take the time. I hope it, it lets up long enough uh, for you to get a sense of what this place looks like. Um, second area is to talk about your conference theme today. So I would submit that the pandemic has highlighted fissures that existed well before the pandemic struck us uh, in actually late uh, uh, or early winter, I should say, of 2019, uh, but really manifest when we went to lockdown on March 12th of 2020, pretty much across the United States, right? Um, and lots happened since then. First of all, it's remarkable that we've lived through this period of such profound social dislocation, of such literal and figurative isolation isolation during that period. Many of us suffered losses. Many of us got sick ourselves. Uh, many of us lost loved ones during this period uh, and people near and dear to us in other ways. It's been truly extraordinary. But we know that in addition to the sheer physical impacts of pandemic, that this has deprived us of yet another measure of faith in government. And every survey that we see uh, fielded by Gallup, fielded by Edelman Worldwide and other organizations, I'm going to say more about Edelman worldwide in a moment, uh, shows that there is declining trust in government at every level, declining trust in media at every level, declining trust in corporate America and small business at every level, declining trust even in those hallowed, uh, trusted institutions uh, in military and police but you, you, you know why police uh, reputations have taken a hit in these last few years. Uh, but if, if we were talking with one another uh, uh, seven years ago, there would only be two institutions above water in, in, in social trust, meaning that people are more likely to trust them than not. And it was the military and police. Uh, police are now underwater. Military is still above water. Every other institution has lost ground against where it was five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And that's a trend that goes back all the way to the end of the 20th century. Pandemic drove a truck through what was left of social trust and drove an even larger truck through what was left of trust in government. And a lot of that, I would argue, has to do with communication. Uh, our, and, and believe me, I love our public health authorities, the CDC, the NIH, uh, uh, NIAID, all those organizations that do such heroic work, and I use that term advisedly, heroic work to uh, understand the science and ultimately to make recommendations that keep us safe. But as scholars, we all know that science is contingent on new discovery. We find new things, and when people who are not themselves scientists scientists see a scientist saying X on Thursday, having said Y on Tuesday, they say, well, that person lied on Tuesday. 
sort of the person didn't lie on Tuesday. The person discovered something on Wednesday that they reformulated and then made new recommendations based upon what they discovered come Thursday morning, right? Um, science evolves. But that's not widely understood, particularly in an environment where people want certainty and where fallibility is punished with attacks on personal integrity. So this is a very, very challenging environment. And if you think about the challenges, particularly in the health arena, with extremely comp uh, complicated epidemiological data, uh, relying on statistical analyses that, frankly, a tiny portion of the population is ever going to understand in their totality. How do you tell these stories? in ways that do not seem to project infallibility, that invite people into a process wherein they can make a judgment and that you make clear that you respect their capacity to make those judgments and provide evidence that cannot immediately be impeached as simply the personal preference or politicized position of somebody who really doesn't embrace science. Follow the science was a great argument in the, fall, in the spring of 2020 when the science wound up going in 15 different directions by the summer of that same year, follow the science becomes a very, very difficult line and in fact is used as a kind of ironic attack line in large portions of red state America at this stage because we did not do a very good job in the health communication arena. So I would argue that you are looking at a profoundly broken government communication system. Um, there is wonderful work that has been done in a variety of disciplines. Uh, I, I recommend uh, strongly Susan Lerman's study out of the Goldman School of Public Policy at UC Berkeley uh, with a book title, Good Enough for Government Work, um, which is a term that, believe it or not, I mean, all of you have heard this, right? Good enough for government, right? Uh, that term actually came about in the late years of World War II, and it was used as a laudatory term to mean it's not you know, this needs to be good enough for government work because we're fighting a war. So it can't just be good enough for corporate America. It can't be good enough for Firestone or General Motors or whatever. It's got to be good enough for government. By the 1950s, that had been turned on its head and it became an attack on oh, good enough for government, right? Not, not all that good. And what Susan's work does is to look at, and she actually studies garbage collection in New Jersey. Okay? That, that's just one of her key examples, that if you go out to a group of people in public and say, this service is provided by government, you're going to get a lower score on exactly the same quality of service than if you go out and survey and say, oh, that was a private company that picked up your trash. You say, oh, the private company does a much better job picking up trash. Um, even when it was a government organization that picked up the trash, right? So I mean, the point is that the, the, the government descriptor itself gears people's sense of what's valuable and how well it's being done. And as we think about the lionization of the private sector, at least since 1980, no, it goes back further than that, but at least since 1980, that's a steady drumbeat of worldview concretization that government, quite frankly, hasn't done a lot to push against and arguably is in one of the worst positions because it's you, you're always losing, right? When you have to say, no, I'm really good. Really, it's me. I, I am good. It's me. I mean, they're already, if you have to say that, you've lost the game. You have to find allies and confederates who can underscore that, that, that point. Now, uh, the, the Lerman work, uh, Lerman is a policy scholar. And she takes a perspective that is inherently communicative. Um, but as you look across the policy landscape, more and more work, and this Edelman Worldwide work actually compares how it is that different countries, there are 35 countries in the Edelman Worldwide database, and they do comparative reputational analyses uh, for government, for nonprofit, for media, and for business. So you can get a longitudinal, they've been at it since 1998, I want to say, uh, you can get a longitudinal analysis of how these things are informed folding year by year with a 35 country based comparison. It's really interesting stuff. I would argue, and this is point number three, that the communication field has a particularly strong role to play here in helping people across a panoply of disciplines, healthcare delivery, government organization, service delivery, regardless of the sponsoring entity across the spectrum, to have people understand what they're looking at and reinforce invigorate a sense of participation and respect that crosses political boundaries, that cross
crosses geographic boundaries, that doesn't place cities at odds with rural areas of the United States or suburbs with exurbs with whatever kind of aggregation you want to see, that doesn't put the southern United States against the northern United States, et cetera, et cetera. It's an enormous challenge. But speaking as a person who got a doctorate in communication studies, but wound up spending most of his academic career in the policy and administration environment and having led the national organizations for policy and administration during the first couple of decades of this century, the policy folks don't know what you know. They don't know that it is not enough to prove that your R squares show the proper variance for intervention Y. Okay, That's great. You want to know that, but that's not enough. What you have to be able to do is to sell people on a vision. You have to give people a sense of what gives their lives meaning and that they contribute to that process of making meaning. This is something our field has been doing for over 2,000 years. We know something about this. And if communication is, rightly, criticized as a kind of uh, uh, kleptocratic discipline, right, uh, that we, we borrow from psychology, we borrow from history, we borrow from sociology, we borrow from management studies and organization theory and all the rest of it, right? We do that all the time. Well, let's look outward. Having done all that good-hearted borrowing over these last few decades, let's now think where we can plug in, not to think narrowly of what gets gets into QJS or what gets into the Journal of Communication or what gets into critical studies and media communication or whatever the case, case might be, but to think broadly, where does communication fit into the panoply of disciplines that make sense of the world? How can we help sociologists be better sociologists instead of asking how sociology can make us better communication scholars? How do we make public policy more effective? How can we prevent my favorite moment, if that's the word I want, of the uh, 2012 election cycle was the woman in Minnesota who went up and thumped Barack Obama in the sternum and said, get your government hands off my Medicare. Uh, and and the president, you know, always reserved an elegant sort of, well, man, Medicare is a government program, right? <laughs> and, and, and so, but what a remarkable moment. You are, you, you are yelling at the president of the United States about a government program, and this gets back to the Lerman example, right? It can't be a government program because I like it. Medicare is the most popular program of the federal government, by the way. If you look at any study, it is the most popular program. And so people reduce their cognitive dissonance by saying, I like it, it must not be government, which is absurd. How do we get there? You folks know the answer to that question. You know how to wrap narratives. You know how to wrap cases. You know how to mix uh, visual imagery with the magic of language to make those cases stick and to craft a new world. So I am delighted that you are here with this topic today. I am delighted that you are here in Union, New Jersey on this wonderful campus and on this urban research university together with the mission that we have together. What you're talking about matters enormously. And I leave you with, with just with one charge, embrace that importance, embrace the value of the work that you do here. Thanks very much for having me today.